Hello, 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 and welcome to our COP online evening service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time to put God first, to seek him, to seek his kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. As always, we start our evening service with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen, amen. For our praise moment, tonight we're going to go to Luke chapter 8. I'm actually going to read to you from the NIV 84. It says, starting in verse 42, As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. You think it was socially distanced? No, it was crowded. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could help her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. <laughs> well, that is a familiar and encouraging story when it comes to our healing, our touching Jesus for all of our needs. And so what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes is, hey, COP, let's light a fire. Light a fire? What does that have to do with this story? Well, in the NLT, it says, someone deliberately touched me. Someone deliberately touched me, for he felt healing power go out from him. Someone deliberately touched me, Jesus said. I got fascinated with that. Deliberately touched me. Yes, that is exactly what happens. Two people can be standing together in church. One person gets nothing out of the service, and the person that's standing next to him is receiving and receiving from the Lord. What's the difference? Somebody deliberately touched the Lord. That word to touch, it is a word that means to hold on to, to seize, to grasp. It is to touch so as to exert a modifying influence upon it. To touch something with the effect that it has a modifying influence upon it. So when it's spoken of as, for example, a fire, 
as it is in Acts 28, verse 2. You remember in Acts 28, they were shipwrecked, then they got to shore, and the first thing they did was start a fire, which is a great thing to do when you're all wet and cold. And that is the same word that is used here, because the fire has a modifying effect upon what it touches, right? So you get that. Let's start a fire, COP, when it comes to touching Jesus. Let's not be that person who just stands in a service or watches the online and just, mm, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, okay. I know, it gives intellectual assent. Let us be that person who reaches out to Jesus with purpose, where something in me is going to be changed because I am in this service right now, today. Something in me is going to be changed. COP, let's start a fire. Let us be that person who deliberately touches Jesus. It's not enough to go through the motions. You go to church. You give mental assent. You even say your loudest amen. But nothing in you changed. Something in you will change when you deliberately touch Jesus. When you reach out to him saying, if I can just touch him, I know I am healed. If I can just touch him, I know my situation in life is changed. This lady, you know that Jesus was, quote, busy. He was on his way somewhere. But you know that no matter how busy Jesus is, individually, he has time for every single one of us. He's never too busy for you. He's never too busy to answer your prayer and to deal with your situation. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's not too busy for you. And it says that this lady had an issue of blood. Well, if someone had an issue of blood, according to the Jewish laws, she was unclean. And anyone she touched would also be unclean. But you know what? It's not that way with Jesus. With Jesus, you can come to him with any of the sin in your life, with any of the brokenness in your life, with anything that other people would go, oh, stand off. But when you touch Jesus, you don't make him unclean. The touching of Jesus results in you being made clean. And that's what happened. Jesus cannot be made unclean by our sin when we come to him. In fact, the blood of Jesus touches us, and he makes clean all that he touches. So it's just the opposite. And that lady was made clean at that very moment. Of course, she touched Jesus, and she touched Jesus deliberately in a way that would light a fire. So, you know, these people, it says they had been waiting for Jesus. They were not people who just, he happened to walk by and start teaching them. They were waiting for him. These are people who wanted to hear from Jesus. These are people who took the time to hear from him. You know, there are just so many people like that. They're good Christians. They take the time to tune in to evening service or to go to fortress or to go to drive in. That's great. But now you're here. It's one step further. Don't just be that person who sits. Yes, I took time. Amen. <laughs> I agree with what the preacher is saying. Be that person who reaches out and deliberately touches Jesus in a way that modifies us, in a way that changes things, in a way that lights a fire. You know, it's just like, wrestling with the angel all night long, like Jacob did. And his name was even changed because he wrestled with God and prevailed. It said he was not going to turn loose until he received a blessing. Be that person. Deliberately touch Jesus. Deliberately reach out to him in a way that maybe the other people around you are not doing. That's okay. 
you reap the benefits and the blessings and the healings and the miracles of that person who reaches out in a way to light a fire. Amen. Are you blessed, COP? Are you challenged? Are you encouraged? Be that person right now, even as we turn our hearts and we turn our attention to worship the Lord right now.
well, we have good news and that we get to have services again after, uh, what, almost a month and a half, almost two months again this weekend. Now, that said, there are some new conditions that are placed upon us, and we're not completely sure how to implement all of this, but we do have some government guidelines that we have to follow. We have a 10% capacity at Maine, East, South, and North Campus for members who have been vaccinated under the level four that we're under right now. Now, this will change under level three. But under the level four right now, it's 10% capacity at Maine, East, South, and North for members who are vaccinated. Now, for Bulacan, Popanga, and Cavite, it doesn't matter vaccinated or unvaccinated, but for NCR, you have to be vaccinated. Now, for our members who are not vaccinated, please, we, will we do not want anyone to be turned away. We will have Fortress 91, and we will have drive-in ready for you. So please reach out to your campus pastors. We will have special things set up for you for Fortress 91 as well as for drive-in. Now, in addition to that, because we have that one hectare lot down at South Campus, we will have outdoor seating set up for the unvaccinated members in the big open lobby area that used to be the driveway where everybody used to eat all the time. We'll have special seating and speakers set up for you out there uh, just to make sure that we got you covered, all right? Now... And that we can run up to 30% capacity out there. But for inside, they want us to have vaccinated. Now, please, I don't want to get into the vaccinated and unvaccinated debate that people are having right now. You know where I stand on all of this. But we're trying to comply because we do not want the government to shut us down. We, we want to do everything we can do, but stay within the guidelines and the laws. All right. Now, we've got some other things that we can announce in a few weeks. So this is going to continue for very long. There's some other things that we can work on. But right now... Let me say it again. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, 7 30, 10, 12 30, and 3. We have 10% capacity for people who are vaccinated. For the unvaccinated, we will have everything set up for you for Fortress 91 when you come, and we will have drive in set up for you. And at South Campus, we will have a special seating area set up outside for you. We don't want to turn anybody away, but please, I ask that you be understanding with us as we go through these government restrictions. Now, everything will change again under level three when we move to level three. Now, please also remember, I'm preaching drive-in service Saturday morning at 7.30 down at South Campus. We just park the cars out in the parking lot, set up the go truck, and we have a wonderful time together. So we'll see you in services this weekend. Before we turn our attention tonight to the book of 1 Corinthians, let's talk about a lot of things that we need to work on. We're starting back up services this week, and I'm so excited to be in God's house again. It's just not the same preaching to the cars, all right? I love being able to see your faces, and, and oh, it's going to be such a joy to be together, at least face mask to face mask. Now, because we're only at 10% capacity, please let me remind you, I will still be preaching a live drive-in service on Saturday morning at 7.30, and then all the rest of the services, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, 7 30, 10, 12 30, and 3, will have a drive in component at South, East, and Maine. Now, we can't do a drive in at North because we can't put the FM transmitter underground, but everything else will have the drive in component. So, for those of you who are not comfortable being inside yet, or you have comorbidities or whatever, uh, the parking lots will be there. Now, we are at 10% capacity, so I would humbly ask some of you to, you know, move around a little bit. Maybe try the, the 7.30 Sunday service or the 12.30 Sunday service or, you know, move around a little bit. Now, we're going to start Friday night with just a night of worship and prayer, just to celebrate being back in. Because we have a lot of emphasis on the word every night in the, in the uh, video services uh, the drive-in services, we have a lot of emphasis on the word and we don't get much time to worship. So Friday night is going to be a worship night, worship and prayer to celebrate getting back into God's house. Amen. So we'll see you Friday night. Now, I don't know the long term. If they let us move up to 30% capacity uh, pretty quickly, then we won't need to do this. But if they're going to keep us at 10% inside and 30% outside, we may actually build a, um, a giant semi-permanent tent structure at South Campus in the grassy area. I mean, if this is going to be something that's going to last long term and we're trying to consult with people to find out what it is, we will do what is necessary. Now, beloved, 
for the last, oh, what is it, 18, 19 months, we've walked through this thing together. We have done everything that we can do within the law to be good pastors because the Great Commission doesn't stop because of COVID-19. And the commandments of God upon us as pastors to feed the sheep and to, to care for the sheep don't change because of COVID-19. We, we can't just stay home and sit in front of a camera and, and send something out to you and think that we've done our job in pastoral care. We, we have biblical commands that are upon us. Now, we've done our best, and we will continue to do our best. Now, we're not going to violate the laws, but we will continue to work as hard as we can. And if that means if we're going to stay at 10% for a while, that we add a a Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Well, we've done daily services in the past, and I preach every night anyway. I'd much rather preach in live. So we will do what is ever necessary to do, to by the grace of God, be good pastors. All right? So let's be faithful to the house of God this weekend, and we'll be excited to see you. Now, let's get back into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. The concepts of understanding spiritual growth. Paul said the natural person, that's the, the unsaved, the, the sukikos, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person, that's a Christian who's born again and growing. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But I, brothers could not address you, the church in Corinth. I couldn't address you as spiritual, born again and growing, but as people of the flesh, as sarkikos, as a carnal Christian, as sarkikos, as infants in Christ, I fed you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Now, we've gone through and we've defined these three types of Christians. The, the natural man, which is not saved yet, maybe they call themselves a Christian as a socio-political term. The sarkikos, or the carnal man, which is born again on their way to heaven, but is still living as an unsaved person. Paul also identifies them as a baby Christian, as mere babes in Christ, as infants in Christ. And the spiritual, or the pneumaticos man, who is born again and growing in Christ. Now, we learned that all spiritual growth requires spiritual food. We're born again by the planting of the Word of God, and we grow by the continual planting of the Word of God, that we, we eat the meat and we drink the milk of the Word and we grow. But we said we have to prepare to receive that spiritual food. We have to have the right attitude toward the Word of God, and we have to remove the yuck from our life. As the Apostle James says in James 1.21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. He said, now listen, you're going to have to get the yuck out of your heart. When your heart is full of the yuck, there's not going to be any room for more of the word to be planted in your heart. So you've got to, you've, you've got to learn to get the yuck out. And you have to learn to persistently use the word. When you don't use it, you lose what you have. You actually regress. And this is what has happened to many of the Sarkikos Christians. Paul says in Hebrews 5.11, since you have become dull in hearing, dull in hearing. Jesus said, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more will be added to you. But he continues, if you don't use it, what you, even what you have will be taken from you. So there are Christians who have, forgive me, grown up in church their whole lives and really at one point were strong believers and they have regressed because all of a sudden they hit some things and they didn't want to apply it. They didn't want to integrate it and assimilate it in their life. Now let's pick up from there and understand, yes, all growth comes from the word, but God is the source of all spiritual growth in our life. God is the cause of spiritual growth. We are not the cause of spiritual growth. Pastors are not the cause of spiritual growth. God is the ultimate source of all spiritual growth in our life. Colossians 2 verse 19. Not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. But Paul says there are people that don't hold fast to the head, which is Christ. 
There are people that are in church, they don't hold fast to the head. And because they don't hold fast to the head, they get off into some weird doctrines. But he said, listen, everybody only grows with a growth that is from God. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Paul said, hey, listen, as pastors, we're not anything, but only God who gives the growth. See, God doesn't share his glory with another. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. And and young pastors, I I would beg of you to listen to me on this. This is why we should never get into this celebrity preacher thing. And we, we, we should never get into this thing where it's all about us. Because forgive me, it's not about us. We're not anything. The only thing that matters is God who gives the growth. Now, applying that, God is the ultimate decider of the spiritual food we receive. Hebrews 6, beginning with verse 1. Paul said, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith in God and of instructions about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. He said, these these are the milk. He said, and this we will do if God permits. If God permits. Now, Now, again, let me speak to all the young pastors out there for just a minute. Pastors. We don't go to Google, the great God Google, and get our sermons, if God permits. The things we teach are the things that God wants us to teach. Pastors, we should be in prayer every week. We, we Every week we should be praying. Forgive me, not just every week, but it's a constant thing. Lord, what is it that you want me to teach? Lord, what is it that you want me to teach? And usually the Lord with me guides me with with series and I have lots of time to study things well out in advance. But from time to time, God throws a curveball and says, no, this is what I want you to do this weekend. And I've got all this wonderful material laid out. But my role is not to argue with God and say, God, I got all this wonderful material laid out. If I got to stay up all night and write something different, I stay up all night and write something different because there are times that God says, no, 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 this, this is what's needed right now. And this we will do if God permits. God is the ultimate decider of the spiritual food of a congregation. Jesus says in John 7, beginning with verse 16 and 17, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Jesus said people who, who, who know the will of God and people who really have a desire now, that there's a there's a little caveat there. Notice, if anyone's will is to do God's will. You know, if you've got somebody who really is plugged into doing God's will, they know when this is God's word. They know this when God's word's being taught. Now, not every Christian understands that. Not every Christian can discern that. But when anyone's will is to do God's will, I mean, when you are just plugged in and all you want in your heart is to do God's will, he said, then you'll know whether this teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. You're going to find that people who are living in rebellion, they don't don't believe anybody but themselves. They don't trust anybody's teaching but themselves. Everybody's all wrong and they're all right. Everybody else is evil, but they're all good. They have no discernment at all because rebellion clouds discernment. Now, Jesus said, now listen, if anyone's will is to do God's will. He will know whether my teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So even Jesus recognized the Father determines the teaching. The Father decides what spiritual food people are to receive. The Father decided what would be taught there on the Mount of Beatitudes. Every year when we go to Israel, well, not every year these days, I guess, but I used to preach a sermon on the Mount of Beatitudes. And then one morning it hit me as we were going out that day to the Mount of Beatitudes and I had my sermon ready and it just hit me. Now, wait a minute. This is what the father decided Jesus was to teach. Why in the world am I saying something else? And ever since that day, when I get to the Mount of Beatitudes, I just read the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. Those were the words the father decided were to be preached that day. 
when Jesus taught in the synagogue of Capernaum. The father decided what Jesus would teach that day. Now, young pastors, please, this is not spooky, weird stuff. This is not difficult stuff. This is just prayer life stuff, okay? This is, this is get your head out of your computer, get your head out of your gadgets, and get your face before God. And you're going to find sermons are not difficult. A young pastor asked me one time, Pastor Summer, how do you write so much material? I said, a prayer life. And they looked at me like that was the weirdest thing they ever heard. I said, you know, writing material, the ideas for material flow from a prayer life. You're, you're, for, for many years, I read my Bible on my knees. Now, my knees aren't quite what they used to be, and some friends bought me a beautiful kneeling bench, and then I used that for a while, and uh, even now. So I have a standing desk now, or I sit. But I like to stand better, I guess. But I sit or I stand, and I read my Bible, and I'm making notes. See, to me, reading the Bible is part of prayer. It's not all of prayer, but it's a piece of prayer. It, it's a big part of what I call listening. Prayer is two-way communication. Prayer is not just talking to God. Prayer is also listening to God. Now, yes, sometimes that still small voice speaks in our heart. But for the most part, you sit there with the Bible and you listen and you say, Father, teach me today. Now, sometimes in my prayer life, my regular prayer life, I'm saying, Lord, teach me. I'm not here as pastor. I'm here as son. I'm just here as your son. I'm here as a husband. I'm here as a father. I'm here as your son. Teach me, Father. In another season every day when I read my Bible, I come to him and say, Father, I'm here as a pastor of a great people. Father, teach me. Show me what to teach. Show me beautiful things from your word that I can teach your people. Show me how to help your people stand in these hard times. Show me how to give hope to people in these hard times. Show me how to lift the heads of your people. Show me how to grow the faith of your people in these hard times. And you know, as you read the word, it's beautiful. The, the things that just begin to come alive in your spirit. Writing sermons, young pastors, is not hard. But it can't be done in your head. It has to be done in a relationship of prayer. The Father is the ultimate decider, and Jesus understood that. Uh, John 16, verses 13 to 15, Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, again, this is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. This is fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. He, he doesn't speak on his own. He, he only speaks what he hears. The Father is the ultimate decider. So, so, so pastors, don't get your sermon ideas from a book. Get your sermon ideas from prayer. Don't get your sermon ideas from, well, you know, we're going to have a collaboration. We're going to all write these sermons together. That's a fellowship with people. Get, your, get your, your sermon ideas in a walk with God. God is the ultimate decider of the spiritual food the people are to receive. Now take this all a step farther. So God causes the spiritual growth, but God is working in our lives. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, English Standard Version. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion or bring it to maturity at the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I want you to take both of those verses there. I want you to understand that it's the same God that brought new life into you, the same God that spoke justification over you, the same God that gave you the new birth, that same God is going to help you as a spiritual baby grow. He began a good work in you, and he will bring it to completion or maturity at the day of Christ Jesus. 
But now while he's working and you notice, he works in you, Philippians 2.13, both to will and to work. In other words, to give you the desire and the ability for his good pleasure. Now, there is a desire that God creates within you for the word. I mean, if the word is going to be part of your spiritual growth, if the word is going to be part of what God is doing within you, he will create the desire for the word within you. Now, now many, many Christians, that God does that, and you dismiss it. And you go back to your stupid video game. Forgive me, young people. Or you go back to your Korean telenovela. When that desire is flowing within you, dig into the word. Every morning you, you get up and there's a desire. I want to learn. I want to hear the words of God today. Yield to that desire. Don't go turn on magandang omaga. You know, keep that off for a while. Let, let, the, let the first hours of the day, let, let the, the first strength of the day be with God. He's created that desire within you. Now, one of the, the, the weird false doctrines that has gone around in these days is, you know, Christians just want the word. Christians just want the word. They're just going to grow fat spiritually. Can you show me any place in the Bible where we grow fat spiritually? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Spiritual growth is not about getting old. It's about getting mature. And spiritual growth is not, never about getting fat. It's about getting stronger. Now, all of us during lockdown, we've, um, uh, we've prospered, shall I say it politely? And even under the face mask, Diba, we can see that the cheeks have expanded because we haven't had some exercise and we've been eating too much. And uh, we like sweets, Diba. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's got little businesses selling sweets these days. But you know the beautiful thing about the word is you never grow fatter spiritually. You grow stronger spiritually. So you, you can never learn too much. Now, you can learn too much theology from a theology book because those are the words of men. But you can never spend too much time in the word. You can never learn too much word. Now, there is a difference between what I just taught you. Now, you know I like to study. You, you, you know I like to study. But, you know, you can spend too much time in the books and not enough time in the book where you just read the word. You will never grow fat spiritually. You will only grow stronger spiritually. Now, let me read it to you from the Amplified Translation, Philippians 2.13. Not in your own strength, for it is God who all the while effectually working in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. Now, we always apply that verse when it comes to Christian service, when it comes to the will of God. But apply it to the most basic will of God in your life, spending time in the word and spending time in prayer. God will create the desire there. Just learn to yield to that desire. Turn off the telenovelas and turn off the video games and spend time in the word. Now, we've talked about God's role. Now let's spend a little bit of time talking about the role of spiritual leaders in our spiritual growth. Now maturity is also caused by leadership within the body. But we have to recognize there's different types of ministries. For instance, Paul had a planting ministry. This is the initiation of spiritual growth. This is the establishment of growth potential. Good planting opens up great potential. Apollos had a cultivation ministry. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6, I planted, there's the planting ministry. Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Sorry, so God causes the growth but two different men, two different, two different types of ministries were working on the same seed planted in those people's hearts. Paul said, I planted, I initiated the growth, and I gave the establishment of growth potential. Apollos came along and developed the growth. 
and cause that growth to become all that God wanted it to be. Now looking at it from a different way. 1 Corinthians 3.10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds. Again, Paul said, my type of ministry is not just a planter. My type of ministry is a foundation layer. Now, if you lay a foundation wrong, forgive me, the whole house is a mess. You cannot build a good house on a bad foundation. I'm sorry, you just can't do it. If you don't have a good foundation, you're not going to have a good house. Recently, we, well, about a year ago now, we put in the, the, the new foundations for Tower 7 down at main campus. And we've got these huge board pilings that were put down there, good for, well, it's, it's, it's a little overbuilt because we know about earthquakes and stuff, and we designed it to handle earthquakes. So we overbuilt it, but we laid a very strong foundation that we can build this beautiful 10-story tower on for our kids' ministries and the offices and things like that, getting ready, ready to build the main auditorium or rebuild the main auditorium. We worked really hard on those foundations because if you don't build good foundations, the future is destroyed. Now, th this is why, forgive me, this is why it's so important when we go out into the provinces and we preach the gospel and we, we start something new when we open a new church, when we, we do a crusade and get people born again for the first time, forgive me, that should be some of our best quality work. Paul said, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Sometimes we want to relegate evangelism to the baby Christians. And in one sense, that's not a problem. But in another sense, it is a problem. We need to make sure that an expert foundation has been laid. And that requires an expert builder. So if, if anything, some of you older pastors out there, forgive me, you should not delegate the crusades and things. The, the more seniors, the, the ones who are expert builders, they should be the one laying the foundations in people's spiritual lives. And forgive me, I think this is some of the problems in the modern church world today, is it wasn't expert builders who laid the foundations. And then when things were built on top of those foundations, the whole house came crashing down. So Paul said, I'm an expert builder. I lay foundations. He said, and someone else is building on it. Now, that could have been Apollos. He said, but each one should be careful how he builds. Paul said, yeah, I, I lay the foundations. I give birth to things. He said, but there are those who develop the things that have already been started. So there are different types of ministries. Now, in addition to different types of ministries, forgive me, there are different quality of leaders. Now, don't get judgmental on this, but just learn the truth. There are some leaders that Paul says will build good things in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, so if you've laid a good foundation in people, even the people who screw up can't destroy the foundation. But he said, there are people who do screw up. He said, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. But if what he has survives, he will receive his reward. Now, I, I draw a little bit of hope from this because I go, okay, if we've gone out and we've laid a good foundation in people's lives, at salvation, then even if some screw up comes along and builds with wood, hay, and straw, and trouble comes along, and most of their spiritual life collapses, their salvation, their foundations in Jesus Christ do not collapse. Ah. This is one of the reasons why I love uh, Pastor Dag from Ghana. He has this huge work, and he is a world-renowned leader. I mean, he sits on boards of Pentecostal World Fellowship, Church Growth International with us. I mean, this is an incredible man of God, huge churches that he has built, but he still goes out and does the crusades. And I got so excited when I saw him. I said, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. Here, here's Pastor Dag. He's out as an expert builder laying foundations because you know that when you've laid a good foundation in Christ at salvation— even if some yuck comes along and screws up the rest of their spiritual life, 
when the trouble comes, the foundations still remain. They're still going to heaven. Ah. But now that said, we have to understand there are different quality of leaders in life. And by quality, I'm not referring to price. I'm not referring to appearance. I'm referring to what they accomplish in your life, what they use to build in your life. Do they build in your life with wood, hay, and straw, cheap things? Or do they build in your life with the precious things, gold, silver, and costly stones? Now, you're going to find out the difference, forgive me, in days like this. These, these are days that are testing the quality of pastor's work. There will be churches that will not remain. In fact, there are churches all over the world right now that have closed permanently. And this has been going on now for 18 months. All over the world, churches closing permanently. There's a reason. What they built in people's lives was built with the cheap things, not with the precious things, not with sacrifice, not with humility, not with service. Now, beloved, in days like this, you can look at your spiritual life and recognize the quality of what we have built as pastors in your life. When your life has been built with the precious things, in the day of fire, the quality of our work is tested. Now, that's a scary thing for pastors because when you look around, into th th these are days of fire. And the quality of our work it is being tested. So, oh, pastor, that's, that's hard stuff. Yeah, that is hard stuff. But the quality of our work is being tested. And the warning I would share with each of you is be careful what you allow people to build in your life. You know, you, you may think that, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. I've got a good foundation. Well, yeah, it does matter. Now, let's say that you are a house and your foundation has been built well by an expert builder. And let's say your early years, your first floor is built well by expert builders. But, you know, then you get to the second floor and, yeah, you were just kind of messing around and just hanging out and going to church with your friends and not caring about, you know, who, who should be speaking into your life. And, yeah, that second floor is kind of a mess. Now, then, then you got yourself straightened around again and got back where God planted you. And your third floor is strong. Well, you know what? In the days of fire, everything above that second floor is going to be lost except by the grace of God. You have to be very careful. You know, my, my, my grandpa was good, good for me on this because when I was a young baby Christian, like every baby Christian, I just wanted to learn and I listened to everybody. And grandpa said, Davey, you have to be careful where you eat. Not just what you eat, but where you eat. He said, Davey, not all spirit, not, not all teaching is of the same quality. You, you, <laughs> Grandpa taught me literally to smell my food. You got to smell your food. You know, you know, have you ever been someplace and people were serving sushi and it looked, yeah, how fresh is that? And you touched it to your lip and it felt a little warm and you smell it. And you know, if I eat this sushi and it's warm and it smells like this, I'm going to spend the rest of the night in the toilet. You, you don't just stick anything in your mouth. Neither do you just stick anything in your soul. This is why Paul said, know those that labor among you. Don't just know about them. You, you, you get to know these people. Now, our role as pastors, whatever our position in life, is to equip the saints. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for works of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all reach, attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, too often, people interpret this verse all wrong, and they think the role of pastors is to bring us to maturity, but that's not what it says. In fact, King James uses three fours. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, literally, what pastors are to do we are to train you and bring you to maturity 
so that you can bring others to maturity. <laughs> Let me say that again. We are to develop you. We are to equip you to be able to serve. We are to, to teach you how to teach. We are to teach you all the truths. We are to teach you how to pray for people, how to minister the Holy Ghost to people. We are to equip you for all the work of the ministry, how to cast out demons, how to pray for the sick. We are to equip you for all the work of the ministry. And then the members are helping each other, building up the body of Christ. In, in the world today, we want to make the ministry a, a a pro, an exclusive profession and, you know, the pastors only can do this, but it's not true. As pastors, we equip you to do the works of the ministry. Now, yes, we are also ministering because we are also members of the body. So we're ministering to people. We're equipping you to minister to people and everybody spiritually grows. Now, I know I've gone a little long tonight, but let me just give you one more thought in closing. First Corinthians 3, verse 7 and 9. Paul said, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive the wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. Now, we're going to get more into this tomorrow night, but I want you to understand a tremendous truth. At some point, you've got to stop being a connoisseur of leadership and start being a field. <laughs> You are not a diner at a restaurant being a connoisseur of spiritual food. You are a field that God plants his seed in. Hmm. You are not a connoisseur going to a fine restaurant and ordering what you want to eat. That is preachers who tickle men's ears, okay? You are a field that the Father has chosen what seed needs to be planted in. Now, I'm going to drop that bomb on you and close out tonight, and we'll pick up tomorrow night. We'll see you. Morning devotions, 545 Daniel's Prayer, morning devotions at 6. We'll see you then. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerville of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Sumrall every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. and Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.